Lord of Jesus Christ, and welcome back to Introduction to Pastoral Care. I'm Father Gregory, and well, you know who you are. And today we are going to talk about playing, praying, and rejoicing, or play, pray, and rejoice. Now, we, we've all of us heard the phrase, pay, pray, and obey. It, it, it's a disrespectful way of how some clergy see the lady. In fact, it's not just clergy who see the lady this way. Sometimes it's the lady who see themselves this way. But in, in place of this corrupt and corrupting clericalism, let me suggest that our vocation as Orthodox Christians is to play, pray, and rejoice. This means that our task as ministers of the gospel, whether we're lay ministers or ordained ministers, is to help people fulfill this call. To do this, however, we need to understand what it means to play, pray, and rejoice. So that's what we're going to look at today. Got a quote there from Dolly Parton that kind of sets the tone for, for where we're going today. Never get so busy making a living that you forget to make life. This kind of summarizes what we're, we're aiming at here when we talk about moderation and balance in, in all things. But let's begin with a story from the Desert Fathers. As much as, 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 as I love uh, Dolly Parton, we're, we're going to go to the Desert Fathers and specifically St. Anthony the Great. A hunter happened to come by and see Anthony talking in a relaxed way with the brothers. He was shocked. The hermit wanted to show him how he, we should sometimes be less austere for the sake of the brothers. And so he said to him, put an arrow in your bowl and draw it. He did so. And Anthony said, draw it further. And he drew it further. He said again, draw it yet further. And he drew it some more. Then the hunter said to him, if I draw it too far, the bow will snap. Anthony answered, so it is with God's work. If we always go to excess, the brothers quickly become exhausted. It is sometimes best not to be rigid. The hunter was ashamed when he heard this and profited much from it. The brothers were encouraged and went home. At some point, if you haven't already, you will eventually meet someone like the hunter. For this individual, the Christian life is best lived in a state of constant effort and great seriousness. Smiling in church, children making noise, or sitting during services are all unacceptable to this person. To borrow a phrase that one of my professors used in graduate school, these people are joy suckers. And that's unfortunate. Because as the late Father Alexander Schmemann says, the source of false relig religion is the inability to rejoice, or rather the refusal of joy. Joy is, as Father Schmemann never tired of pointing out, the defining characteristic of the Christian life. And he says, as I heard a moment ago, that the source of all forts, false religion is to as the inability to rejoice or rather the refusal of joy he goes on to say that joy is absolutely essential because it is without any doubt the fruit of god's presence one cannot know that god exists and not rejoice at the same time we can say that nothing so undermines my faith in god as the absence of joy whether the absence is in my own heart or in the hearts of those around me. The absence of joy corrupts Christian faith from within. Why? Well, again, Father Schmemann gives us the answer. It is because only in relation to joy, it is only in relation to joy that the fear of God and humility are correct, genuine, and fruitful. Outside of joy, they become demonic the deepest distortion of any religious experience, a religion of fear, a religion of pseudo-humility, a religion of guilt. They are all temptations, traps, very strong indeed, not only in the world, but inside the church as well. Somehow, religious people often look on joy with suspicion. Listen again to what St. Anthony tells the hunter. 
so it is with the work of God. If we always go to excess, the brothers quickly become exhausted. It is sometimes best not to be too rigid. He says this in his defense of the brothers relaxing. Well, this then raises a question. What does relaxation have to do with the life of faith? Maybe to defend the hunter and the serious voices among us, in, among us in the desert fathers, when we read the word play, it is typically in reference to temptation, the spirit of lust playing with him. If, it, if lust allures us and we keep playing with it, it becomes as difficult to break as iron. The demon played a trick and upset the lampstand. For the fathers of desert fathers, Play is often associated with the demonic. And so if we read that unwisely, uncarefully, then we, we are likely to walk away thinking that seriousness and, and the absence of joy is somehow the defining characteristic of the Christian life. But in fact, for the Desert Fathers, play doesn't refer to what our authors describe as free play. Rather, the play of the demons and temptations are, are not an activity that is freely chosen and directed by the participants and undertaken for its own sake, but rather directed by sin to achieve the aims that are distinct from the activity itself. In other words, the play of demons is not about free play. It's not about joy. It's about manipulation, about trying the demons trying to move us in a particular direction, which is condemnation. Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm, I'm not suggesting that structured play is demonic. It's not. Activities like piano lessons and soccer practice have their place. Structured play is not the problem. What is the problem is the relative absence of free play. Besides, the, why do I say that? Well, besides the reason that our authors sketch out for us, what they call free play is how children learn to pray and worship. Structured play is not the problem. Again, it's not the problem. Structured play, or more, maybe more accurately, work, is also important in learning how to pray, even as it is in learning how to speak or get dressed in the morning. Children need to both play and work. Not only that, they also enjoy playing and working as long as they can do so in a balanced way. Work and play are for work and play are for the adult as well a source of joy. We work, we play and we experience joy as long as that work and play are balance. Children need to both play and work. And again, they enjoy playing They, as long as they can do so in a balanced way. Again, this is what St. Anthony tells the hunter. If we are excess in our playing or working, we soon become exhausted. We can see this easily enough in the person who is always working. But it's the same with the person who is always playing. Think about the individual who lives for fun at the expense of meeting his obligations to family, his employer, or to God. We don't trust this person, and we certainly don't respect him. Why is that? Adam Smith says that the compassion of the spectator must arise all together from the consideration of what he himself would feel if he were reduced to the same unhappy situation. The person who sees life all as fun and frivolity is incapable of experiencing compassion for others because he's simply selfish. He's simply self-absorbed. He doesn't act in his own self-interest. But out of very, for very selfish motives. Adam Smith says that, goes so far as to say, we hold in contempt the man who doesn't pursue, or worse, doesn't even know his own self-interest. 
unlike Calvin in the comic strip here, we don't value selfishness. The individual who fails to do what is in his own best interest is at a minimum seen as immature, irresponsible, and incapable of caring not only for himself, but of being a good neighbor to others. Indeed, the selfish individual rather than the self-interested individual is a burden on others, his family, the church, and the wider society. What we're looking for is to balance play and work so that we can not only worship God in spirit and truth, but to do so joyfully. Getting the balance right between work and play is what the philosopher Joseph Pieper means when he says that leisure is the basis of culture. Let me see if I can bring this up a little bit so you can see it. Uh, I, it didn't come out very well. I'm sorry. Uh, picked the wrong background. Leisure is only possible when we are one with ourselves. We tend to overwork as a means of self-escape, as a way of trying to justify our existence. So the person who overworks, the, like the person who overplays, suffers from a poverty of self-knowledge. He's trying to escape his responsibilities either by com over and committing in work or overindulging in play. But in either case, he does this because he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know what he is about. We must work. Labor is part of our original vocation. In fact, human work or labor is arguably the central reason for God creating, or at least a central reason. What do we read at the end of the first chapter, Genesis? Then God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our image and like in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So all of this creation that God engages in, all of these things that he makes, he gives to the human couple for their life, for their sustenance. And as we had read a little bit earlier in Genesis, or actually we'll read in a second Genesis, this requires that humanity cultivate the earth, that they fill the earth and subdue it. It's not, it's not only just a reference to procreation, it's also a reference to humanity engaging in creative work. So God looks at this and he entrusts the creation to the creative intelligence of the human and says it is very good. So we, we see in humanity as the worker, the laborer of creation, the, really the cultivate or the culmination of God's creative process. But let me make this a little stronger. Together with Jesus resting in the tomb on Holy Saturday, God resting and blessing creation on the seventh day is the pattern for the central act of Christian worship, the Eucharist, in which we not only thank God for all that he has done for us in Jesus Christ, but go on to offer to God the works of our hands, not only in the form of bread and wine, but also song and ritual. Our liturgical life sums up our work and play. More than that, it gives meaning to both. 
cut off from worship, Pieper says. Leisure or play becomes laziness and work inhumane. And so to rest from work means that time is reserved for divine worship. In other words, the celebration of the Eucharist and of the other services of the church when we gather together to worship God, as well as our private life of prayer, is the summit, the culmination, the perfection of work and play. At this point, we are now making the transition in our discussion in this class between the different questions that Prudence asks. Having seen where we are, we must now ask where we are going so that we can now see the next steps we must take. Yes, there are problems in the culture. We've examined these for the last several weeks at, to get a sense of our starting point. But in a fallen world, when, is, when are there not problems in culture? When we look at the pastoral situation of the church in America, we see that the, we, we, we've seen the problems afflicting children and young adults. But when we looked a little bit more closely, we realized that the root cause of these problems, or that maybe the, the proximate cause of these problems, a better way to say it, not young people, but us. We who are leaders have failed to lead. Or maybe better, we've led, but not well. Children and young adults are out of balance because we who are parents, teachers, and, and yes, pastors, are ourselves out of balance. It does no good for, e for either those I serve or myself to blame the culture, universities, or the media. Yes, they all have their role to play, but what does Jesus tell me about blaming others? He says in Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, the 15th verse, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The fact is, like everyone else, I get the balance between work and play wrong. And I do so because I've lost sight of what Jesus tells me, and not as an outsider, as someone looking at him from a distance, but as someone who has already drawn close. Jesus gives this warning to us who are disciples. And if it's applicable to the disciples of Jesus Christ, it is even more applicable to those of us who are leaders within the church. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put in it. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Oh, how much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say, to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things as well. But rather seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm not about to tell you not to work. But what I am telling you is that Jesus is saying, do not worry. Or 
As St. Ambrose reminds us, lilies spring not from the barrenness of mountains and the wilderness of forests, but from the loveliness of gardens. I'm called to cultivate the earth. I'm called to work and I should work. But I should work in a way that is in harmony with the divine will. Which is why Ambrose goes on to say, I must cultivate the life of virtue. Where there is integrity, chastity, piety, faithful silence of secrets, the saint says, we find as well the radiance of angels, the violets of confessors, the lilies of virgins, and the roses of martyrdom. In other words, I do need to work. I, I do need to play. But I need to do so in a way that is obedient to God, that is a reflection of the cultivation of the life of virtue rather than simply selfishness. I must cultivate virtue to find joy. I love this quote from Flannery O'Connor because it's, Fl it's Flannery O'Connor who's always a lovely person to read. She's very pointed if, if somewhat direct. Virtue must be, uh, must be the only vigorous thing in our lives. Sin is large and stale. You can never finish eating it nor even digest it. It has to be vomit. The fact of the matter is we gorge ourselves. I gorge myself on sin and it simply makes me sick. It is heavy and it is stale and it is nausea-inducing. Sin robs me of joy. What gives me joy is virtue, is living a life in which my habits foster not only human flourishing, but also holiness and charity for my neighbor and communion with God. Always the pastor and the pragmatist St. Augustine looks at me and tells me how I am to cultivate the virtues that St. Ambrose recommends that I have. If you lack earthly riches, the Bishop of Hippo says, do not seek them in the world by evil deeds. If they fall to your lot, let them be stored up in heaven by good works. A virtuous Christian soul should neither be overjoyed at acquiring them nor cast down when they are gone. Let us instead reflect on what the Lord says. Where thy treasure is, there your heart will also be. Surely when we hear what that we should lift up our hearts, the familiar answer that we should not. Surely when we hear that we should lift up our hearts, the familiar answer that we should make, that we should not be, that we make should not be a lie. In other words, if I want to have joy, I need to focus on the kingdom of God, the life which is to come. But the first thing I know, or, or the, how I do that is, sorry, let me try that. How do I do that? Well, the first thing I do is I need to not do what I know is wrong. I, I was asked by a family member, actually one of my brothers, a while ago, how, do I, how am I happy? And I said, well, I mean, this is how I'm happy. If it's wrong, if I know it's wrong, I don't do it. And second, I must do what good I can for others, always keeping my focus on the kingdom of God. So I... I don't have joy in my life because I do the things which are sinful. I don't have joy in my life because the good things that I know I can do, I don't do. I don't have joy in my life because I focus my attention on anything and everything other than the kingdom of God. As Orthodox Christians, we tend to talk a great deal about the church instead of the kingdom. This is, I think, one of the ways in which we inadvertently kill joy in our communities and in the hearts of our faithful. 
We also tend to talk about theology, spirituality, liturgy, and asceticism. But we fail to tell people about Jesus. We have all of us fail to take seriously the command given to the man, Jesus freed from the demons. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went in his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city the great things Jesus had done for him. That's a challenging gospel. I have to ask myself, do I tell people about the great things that Jesus has done for me? Do I tell people about the great things that God has done for me? Do I even know what God has done for me? The reason that young people become so out of balance is because we who are their parents, teachers, pastors, have ourselves become out of balance. And I'm not talking about those people who are outside the church. I'm talking about those of us who are in the church. We have lost sight of the great things that God has done for us. Or if we know them, we don't talk about them. We don't tell them. Simply put, I fail to tell people what God has done for me. And in my failure, I leave others ill-equipped to face temptation. Nature abhorring a vacuum. This means that if I don't tell people about Jesus, someone else will. And I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity of talking to an Orthodox Christian who has abandoned the church for evangelical Christianity because he hears about the love of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this when we get to the seminary, but there's some interesting data, social scientific data out there. And one of the things that's really interesting in a sad kind of way is that for every one evangelical Christian who becomes Orthodox, two Orthodox Christians become evangelical Christians. And the reason they become evangelical Christians is because evangelical Christians tell them about Jesus, tell them that they're loved by Jesus where we're not doing that. What's even worse, though, of someone abandoning the Church of Jesus Christ for evangelicalism is when they go in search of a false or a counterfeit savior. And that counterfeit savior can be sex. It could be drugs, it could be rock and roll, it could be sports, it could be work, it could be pleasure, it could be all sorts of things. But the reality is, if we don't help pe fill up people's hearts with the love of Jesus Christ, they're going to look for something else to fill their hearts up with. So in our next series of lectures and discussions, we'll look at how, as Orthodox Christians, we tell people about Jesus and help lead them to the kingdom of God. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can read what I said. I said a moment ago, we, 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 we talk a great deal in the church about everything and anything other than Jesus Christ. There's that quote that I read a moment ago. We have to shift that, but we have to learn how to do it in a way that is compatible, consonant, in harmony with the tradition of the Orthodox Church. Like I said at the beginning, pastoral theology is asks three questions. The most important question is where are we going? The second most important question is where are we? The third question is how do we get there? These last several lectures, we've talked about where we are. And it's not a great place, but it's not the worst place in the world either, because as we've seen along the way, there are little hints of grace that can be found. That's why it's so important as men and women who are training to be pastors in the church that we not let ourselves get swept away by the bad things that we see around us. We have to be able to look and discern carefully the will of God that's hidden 
within these things. It's only then that we know the steps that the, we need to take. But we discern the trace of grace in this present moment by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and his King. Well, a shorter lecture today. I'm still recovering from COVID, so uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I'll post this and uh, we will have our conversation. So uh, until then, uh, everyone take care. God bless you. Stay healthy. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone um, in at the seminary in December. So, all right. God bless you all.